Hey, welcome to the Explored Podcast with Scott and Ryan. Uh, Scott's not here today, but we have a great guest on, Mitch Howard. He is a full-time real estate investor from Nebraska that has a lot of knowledge and can give us a lot of good information. Mitch, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, uh, you know, I found you on, uh, I think I've seen you on Bigger Pockets and then uh, you've been putting out some really good Instagram reels and stuff like that with a lot of good information. So I was pumped that you agreed to come on and uh, share your knowledge and stuff of real estate. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. I've you know just kind of started to release some content finally after a few years of being in the game. And so, you know, hopefully it can help some people and serve people to get started in real estate. That's what my whole intention with it is. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned just before we we started recording, you started in software sales and then you got into real estate. Can you kind of, you know, tell us the beginning, kind of the transition of, you know, kind of how you got started and then how you went to, you know, full-time investing? Yeah, for sure. Um, the story is, you know, I started a job right out of college doing software sales for a construction management software company. And so, you know, I was meeting with construction companies, developers on the East Coast that are doing huge projects and, you know, giving them demos of our product. And I was also seeing kind of the insides of their business as well as I was doing that. So I, you know, really opened my eyes to, you know, one, how much money these companies make, but, you know, also how their operations work. And so, you know, from there, I decided, you know, that's probably something long term I'd like to get into. And so I, I remember specifically, I googled how to become a real estate developer and clicked on the first book I found and I bought it. And in chapter one, it said, you need a lot of money and you need a lot of resources, two of which I had none of. And so I uh, went back to Amazon and I picked up a book by Brandon Turner, how to purchase real estate with low or no money down. Um, and that was the first book that really just taught me, you know, how do you buy something? And so from there, I spent two to three months just diving into material, reading as many books as I could, probably a book every two or three days, uh, just educating myself on, you know, what strategy I wanted to do, what I wanted to buy and, and how I was going to go about it. So um, ended up buying my first house in 2017, which was a house hack. Uh, it was a four bed two and a half bath house, which is exactly what I was looking for. I got a pretty good deal on it. Um, charged my roommates 500 bucks a month to live there with me. Uh, filled the other three rooms and my mortgage was about 1100 bucks a month. So I was making four to four to $500 a month uh, to live in my own house. And so uh, that really got me addicted to real estate. It taught me how to be a landlord and you showed me the possibility and, and also open things up for me financially, you know, to be able to save more money It knocked out a huge living expense. Uh, so then I can start to funnel that money, save a little bit more uh, and put that into more real estate. Nice. So house hacking was kind of the beginning. Um, I feel like uh, there's a lot of people that kind of start there. Uh, where, where'd you buy that house? Is that, was that in Nebraska or? Yeah, I was living in Omaha, Nebraska at the time. Uh, I purchased that house for one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is exactly what it was listed for. It had nice. it had actually been flipped by somebody else, uh, so it was already renovated and ready to go. Um, nice house, and it was it was honestly the perfect situation for me. Dang that! Yeah, I mean it's hard it's hard to be uh, living in a house and basically getting paid to live there because I mean you took the financial risk and stuff like that, so right. you deserve. You deserve that. Um, and I mean, that's great that you're, were they friends that were roommates or? Yeah, friends, coworkers, um, you know, my my mindset around it was they could either go out and get a one bedroom place for, you know, 800 bucks a month, or they could rent for me for 500 bucks a month and have a backyard and their own bathroom uh, and pretty much the same setup. So that's the way I looked at it. It was a no brainer for them to be able to live with me and, you know, it helped me out too, to be able to save some money. So yeah, that it's kind of a win for everyone there. Yeah. And it's really rare, obviously to be able to get a property at what it's listed for too. So, yeah, well, um, you know, the market now. was just, yeah, the market was really just kind of picking up back then and um, stuff was still going for over asking a little bit, but I remember it got listed I was the first person to go see it. I put in an offer immediately and and got the deal. So, do you still have that property? 
I just sold it this year. Nice. Sadly. Did you make, I'm assuming you made quite a bit, right? Yeah. I, in, in appreciation, I definitely did. Yeah. Um, you know, I've offloaded most of my single family at this point. And, you know, I, I just came to a realization as an investor that I'm probably not going to get rich uh, doing single family long term. And so, you know, my intention is to get more into the multifamily and commercial side of things, but uh, offloaded pretty much all of my single family, still have a couple of left. And I did get some good appreciation from those single families over the years. And, and that has certainly helped me move forward uh, to become a better investor. That That's a perfect transition where I was wanting to go. I got a bone to pick with you. Uh, one of your Instagram videos, one that kind of stuck out to me the most was uh, you said that you're not a big fan of single families, which we deal in a lot of single families and, uh, Scott, who's not here has a pretty good portfolio and does quite, you know, we've done flips mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Um, and you said that you were at this point in your investing career, you're focused on, on uh, triple net lease and commercial and, uh, what else did you say? some other stuff is that mostly just flipping like when i look at single family i look at it as really just a flip opportunity to to get that cash out and go put it into something else long term um you know single family i nothing bad to say about it really it, you know it's a great wealth builder and it's a great right. way to get started and it's where pretty much everybody starts and you look at guys like david osborne that have built 100 200 300 unit portfolios of single family they are rich but that's you know that's a lot to build over time and sure. you got to have a lot of patience and, and, and they're just one door, one tenant, you know, you don't have the economies of scale like you do with multifamily. And so, um, you know, I think before I built a portfolio of a hundred of them, uh, I kind of wanted to just get out of there and, and start getting into multifamily and commercial. I got you. So, uh, you're mainly doing flips to fund your other investments of commercial and stuff like exactly. that. Yeah, okay. just, you know, I'll probably flip homes forever just because it's on autopilot for me at this point, pretty much. I've got the team built and the resources. And so, um, you know, I'll continue to do it because it's a good, good revenue source to to keep money coming into the business. But um, and the example I used in that reel, I think, and, and I saw you commented $800 <laughs> a month cash, a cash flow. flow. On a single awesome. family. Yeah. <laughs> but so I, I still have two single families left. And both of those uh, were eight hundred dollars or more cash flow a month. I'd and keep them. I'll probably keep them for another ten years. Most likely, they're pretty new yeah. properties, um, and we nice. like them, so they perform well, and we keep them. But still, you have one shower, one water heater, something goes out, and it really just wipes out your cash flow for for a whole year. Yeah. Um, so they are, they're frustrating, but you know, we still have the equity in those that we can, we can play around with if we need to put those toward another investment as well, but we'll probably hold on to those for a while. Nice. Well, before I, uh, you start, you know, we get into the commercial stuff. Um, you, you just mentioned that you will probably do flips forever to fund your other ventures and you got a team in place for all that. Could you kind of, uh, dive into that a little more, uh, maybe start kind of when you're looking for a deal and then kind of the steps after that from, you know, what do you look for and to the sale of the flip? What does that look like for you? Of course. Yeah. So, um, you know, as far as doing the the marketing and the sales, that's on me. Um, I, I do all that myself. Uh, so all the direct to seller marketing, speaking to sellers, going to talk to them, putting things under contract, managing that till it closes, that's on me. Uh, and I also manage all my own properties as well. Um, manage the flips and the project management. And so then really my team just consists of an agent that sends me deals when I need her and uh, she can help me out with things and, and run comps for me. And then also a contractor that I've pretty much just made a, a handshake agreement with and and he, he signed some documents as well uh, to be my subcontractor. And so his pricing is good. It fits what I need on every project. And, you know, he's, he's been good about communicating with me um, when I'm not able to make it out to the job site. And so, you know, those are the two really big ones, you know, having a good agent that can run comps for you and then having a contractor that's reliable and you could trust and it's not going to price gouge you. 
So are you mainly looking uh, at on market properties right now then, or how are you finding deals? Cause I mean, we're most places, I mean, prices are still somewhat elevated. We're starting to see some trends down a little bit, but in the past year, two years, it's been tough to find flippable houses on the market. Yeah. If you're looking on Zillow, you're going to have a pretty tough time uh, in the past yeah. two years, especially now you're, there's definitely more indicators on Zillow and, and on the market, the MLS that you can go after, um, you know, houses have been sitting a lot longer. Prices are starting to decrease and and sellers are getting a lot more motivated when they've been sitting on the market for two months. Um, so those are typically indicators that you can start to go after and and make lower offers um, and, and give yourself a chance of getting a deal that's on the market. Otherwise, yeah, everything that I'm going after otherwise is off market because those are where the best deals are at is, is going direct to seller. And, um, you know, if you want to flip wholesale or, or do a burr off market is going to be the best way to go. Um, trying to find deals off market. And, nice. and the good thing about having an agent too, is a good agent that knows how to think like an investor. They understand what an investor wants. They will send you deals before they hit the market. They'll send you pocket listings, um, and and they'll give you the inside info on what you need to get that deal. Nice. So are you, uh, so it's mainly the agent that is uh, finding the they have a deal come across their desk and they throw it your way. Like, hey, are you going to be interested in this? Is that kind of the how it's going? Yeah, I've got her set up to to ping me properties that come on the market. But for the most part, my work with with my agent is, yeah, she she gets something that comes across her desk that hasn't been listed yet. And she's sending that over to me to see if I have interest to go look at it and buy it. Nice. And then do you uh, do you have like a formula that she kind of knows of, you know, kind of price point and, you know, how much you're going to want to offer after repair value and stuff like that? Or what? What does that look like? Not so much of the numbers and the underwriting she's not involved with at all, but um, I guess more so just criteria of, you know, I won't touch anything usually smaller than three bed, one bath, nothing past 1970. Um, so I have specific criteria of things that she'll send me, but as far as the underwriting goes, that's all done on my end. Um, you know, I, I go off the 70% rule. Yep. Um for pretty much every property, it gives you a little wiggle room, especially if you need to negotiate. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't get every property at 70% minus repairs. Uh, typically that gives you some, some wiggle room. And if you do get a deal at that, at that rate, that's pretty, a pretty phenomenal deal. Right. If you do. Yeah. Um, just for people that might be listening that don't know what the 70% rule is, could you explain that in more layman's terms? Yeah. So a 70% rule is uh, when you're flipping, or wholesaling, it's you want to get the property at 70% of the after repair value. Um, so we're running com comparable prices in neighborhoods. We're taking the closest five houses on square footage, year built, baths, bedrooms. We're taking the average of those five houses that were sold in the past six months. That gives us our ARV. And then we're taking 70% of that number minus what we think it's going to cost to fix that property up. That, that's a good explanation. There's, you know, there's just yeah, a lot of people that, no, I think that was perfect. That was a, a really good way for people. Uh, you know, that, that should be a video of yours. That was a really good explanation there. So uh, <laughs> good, good. Um, so your contractor, you said that he's uh really well priced and stuff. Did, was this your first contractor? A lot of people have to go through several. To, to find the good one. Yes. When I was doing my first flip, I remember I had searched, I needed, I needed some demolition guys and yeah. I needed some drywall guys. And I was calling down a list of Google businesses, calling drywall companies. They're all three to four months out, you know, um, which is not good for an investor. Typically you need somebody right. that's readily available within 30 days of you closing um, and has a team in place that can get to the job site. And I was probably 30 businesses down. I called this guy. He was, uh, he's a drywall contractor, but he had people under him that can do all kinds of work. And so he acts as a general, acts as a general contractor as well. Um, and 
you know, he's been, he's been great. He, he's been great on communication, everything that I've asked out of him. Uh, if there's something that I don't know, he's, he's really helpful. He just tells me the truth and he's honest about things. And, you know, if I need something, he'll have a guy on the job site typically that same day. So super reliable. Nice. Yeah. I feel like finding a good contractor is definitely key, but you know, they're getting calls all day from, you know, new investors, people trying to get into flipping, but you know, I'm sure how many deals have you done with them roughly? Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah. I've done 12 deals with him. Okay. Yeah. So, so he, he knows your business and you mm-hmm. know what you're going to want and need. So once you build that relationship, I feel like, you know, that's when you can really start moving the needle because he knows what you want. Um, you know, kind of, you know what to expect, but it, I feel like it's tough for a lot of people to find that contractor. You know, there's so many horror stories out there of, you know, contractors not doing what they said or overcharging. And then that cuts into your profits or you go into the red on certain projects. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Thankfully, I've never lost money on a project um, as yeah, I know. Right. That's so this, that's it's rare. These past, these past few months, um, I did break even on one just because the market, I tried to time it right before winter hit where I'm at because things really slow down in the winter. Um, I live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And so things really will slow down. Uh, the market slows down. There's not many buyers on the market. And so, you know, I sat on something for a couple of months and had to drop the price uh, $25,000 to get to a break even point and just offload it so I can, you know, get ready for the next project. But, um, yeah, thankfully I've never lost money on a project and and gone in the red, but it came pretty close this year. Yeah. Were, were you pretty nervous or is it just a numbers game for you? You know, I, I wasn't too nervous to break even on that project. You know, yeah. I was just happy to, to be able to turn it, get it to a new homeowner, um and, and just move on to the next one yeah like you said it's pretty much a numbers game at this point you know i'm not going to pull my hair out over breaking even on one project or even if i if i lose 10 grand on a project it's not the end of the world i'll just move on to the next one and i think real estate investing and you know coming from a sales background you, you really have to have a tough mindset and you have to mm-hmm. be ready to move on to the next thing and, and you can't stress out too much over um you know those losses that you do have or those failures you just got to learn from them and move on right yeah i mean and that's the key is learning from them um if you continue to lose money you're not going to last in the yeah. business obviously that's so right. it's it's uh i mean everything's a learning opportunity right i'm sure you know you've you've experienced that in your investing career well like you mentioned sales um mm-hmm. we do you know real estate agent stuff and so we do sales as well and I mean, rejection is definitely tough at first, but if you can just learn something from each one and each deal, you know, ultimately you're going to keep growing. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. And as long as your, your underwriting's good and you're, you're doing things right on the front end and buying correctly, then you shouldn't have problems. And I have a lot of trust in, in my underwriting and, you know, having saying that I've never lost money on a deal says a lot about what I do on the front end of things um, right? and the numbers, the numbers work out. And, you know, I was maybe a little late in adjusting to what the market did uh, here this winter. And and that's why I broke even on a project, but I learned from that lesson and it won't happen again. Right. Hey, there you go. <laughs> um, so it, let's uh, let's transition to the, to the commercial uh, investing that you're doing. And sure. uh, you mentioned syndications in that video. Uh could you just kind of go into detail on that? Uh, you can kind of pick which one you want to go into first. Yeah, I've started up a, a syndication with a partner of mine. Uh, we'll be focusing primarily on uh, value add multifamily, which is obviously a very competitive market, but we see a lot of opportunity uh, here in the Midwest where we're at. And so we'll be targeting properties 50 to 100 units plus um, for that. We have yet to get our first one under contract, but everything's set up and ready to go. We're just hunting for that first deal right now. Um, I have taken part in some uh, other syndication deals as a limited partner 
Uh, last year, I was fortunate enough to participate in a $4.5 million purchase uh, of a triple net commercial deal in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, that was four units. And so that's been probably my favorite deal I've done so far, just because it was mostly, you know, 100% passive, but also gave me an inside look at what a syndication looks like, how to set it up. Um, and we've actually taken some guys from that team and added them to our team for what we're going to be doing with the multifamily stuff as well. Oh, nice. So you, uh, people you worked with on the other syndication are going to work in hand in yours as well. Exactly. Legal team broker. Um, and so, you know, they've obviously done it before they know how to set it up. They know all the legal language, uh, the sec regulations. And so, um, you know, they've been extremely helpful and, and getting everything set up and, you know, making it easy on us. So yeah, we're just it, really the guys hunting for the deals and, and running the deals. Gotcha. Yeah. We're actually uh, going through that right now, the legalities and stuff like that. We have people mm -hmm. ready to invest, but you know, we, we got to get all our ducks in a row before we, we do anything. Um, so for people that, you know, you mentioned the syndication was pretty much hundred percent passive. Um, you have to have capital um, to get into that. But people that might have capital that are interested in the syndication investing, what do you recommend that kind of they look for in a syndication? Um, are they offering you a track record of what they what they've done? Uh, what does that look like for you when you are looking for that first syndication investment? Having somebody you know that's a general partner certainly helps a lot uh, that you can trust. Um, otherwise if it's somebody you don't know, absolutely. You want to see a track record of returns, uh, that investors have gotten previously. Um, typically what we're going to be targeting for properties is we're looking for a 14% IRR and 20% cash on cash return with a fi five year exit. Um, and that would be value add multifamily or, or value add commercial. And so those are hard numbers to hit. Uh, and typically, if you do, you're going to have some pretty excited investors that are going to want to come back and and invest in the next deal. And so um, those are the kind of numbers we're looking for if we're looking at a track record of of who we want to invest with or somebody that we know and trust. Because, you know, unfortunately, there are uh, probably some shady characters out there trying to put syndications oh, yeah. together. But, um, you know, you got to vet, obviously, where you're going to put your money and and be careful about who you're you're giving your money to. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, the single families, uh, with you doing flips and stuff like that, that gives you a lot of good experience in the value add piece, you know, rehabbing stuff. It's a little different being a mm -hmm. big commercial, but you have the, the basics of, okay, this bathroom, it's probably going to cost us this. I mean, hopefully you can do a little cheaper if you're doing 50 bathrooms, but, um, yeah. Do you think your, your experience in flips and stuff like that, do you think that's going to apply pretty directly? Or how do you feel that's going to apply in the large 50, 100? I call that a large multifamily. Yeah, yeah managing the rehab, I'm extremely comfortable with. Um, just you know, combining my background with construction management uh, into flipping homes. I, you know, I feel very confident uh, in just managing, managing a subcontractor and managing a project. And so that'll certainly translate uh, very well for me. The biggest adjustment from single family to, to large multifamily is just the underwriting. Um, it's just, it's a lot more intensive. It's a lot more granular um, and the numbers are bigger. So, you know, it certainly makes it, uh, it takes longer to underwrite a multifamily deal, obviously, um, you know, a single family, I can typically look at, do some quick napkin math and know whether or not it's a deal. Um, and, and multifamily, you got to sit down and you got to, you got to enter your numbers into your spreadsheet and, and figure out if it's a good deal or not. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, it's, you've done several flips and stuff like that. Single family, do mm -hmm. those big numbers, are they a little intimidating to you or does that sh kind of thing shake you or? Not, not really. Um, you know, it's just, it's just another zero on the end of it. And, right. and the deal is bigger. Sure. The profit is bigger. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, what, what we're really looking for is, you know, to get our investors a return, you know, so raising the money 
you know, that's probably the biggest, like in my mind, the biggest hurdle, you mm-hmm. know, you know, do I have enough resources out there that want to invest in a deal with me? Right. Um, but like most people say, as long as you have the deal, the numbers make sense. Your underwriting's accurate. The money will come as long as you have the deal. Um, and, and people got to trust you, you know, your, your company has got to be presentable. You got to have a website, you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta look good and it's yeah. gotta be an investable product for you to be able to raise money for people. So I'd, I'd say raising the money is probably raising the money and the underwriting is probably the biggest, uh, adjustment going from single family into the multifamily space. Right. Cause it's not just your money on the line. You're taking other people's money and they want to feel exactly safe and warm and fuzzy when they're handing you you know tens of thousands of dollars um yeah and, and you can get flexible with your your water waterfall structure and how you do payouts to your investors and if it's your first deal you know maybe you go with an 80 20 structure over a 70 30 um and so you know just to prove to your investors hey you know we want you to come invest with us again we we want to do you a favor and give you 80 percent of the returns on this project and, and you've also you're also competing you know you're, you're competing against 100 million dollar companies that have been doing this for 20 years and, and oh, when yeah. you're doing that you know you have to go above and beyond to get investors attention to to invest with you instead of these established companies that have been doing it for so many years yeah uh but that, that's actually interesting i think uh I don't know. I'm sure you read a lot being in the space, but they're saying a lot of these syndications and funds are because of the past five years of the real estate market that they're over leveraged. Banks aren't refinancing. They're basically not going to help them um, because, I mean, they're so over invested. Are, are you thinking mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of opportunity? Is that kind of why you pick the space moving forward? I think there will be a lot of opportunity in both multifamily and single family uh, in the coming years. We're still kind of in a period where things are still shifting. Um, you know, sellers are are not completely awake to the reality of, of what's happening yet. And they're still kind of looking for high prices. And so that's what we've seen is um, it's still just adjusting. But I think in the next two to five years, there's going to be so much opportunity that's going to come available. And so uh, certainly in the multifamily space, and, and, you know, that is one thing that makes me really excited to, to get into it. Yeah, no. And I think so too. It's uh, I mean, I, I obviously feel for those people that might lose money and, you know, hopefully they're not personally each individual, mm-hmm. you know, putting themselves in a bad situation for them and their families, but you know, there's been yeah. a lot, a lot of funds, and that's kind of we're we're one in the same. We're going to start one as as well in the Kansas City areas where we'll be based. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do agree. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity with. I mean, people are just over leveraged. Same in single family. There's unfortunately there's going to be a lot of individuals that are over leveraged because of what the markets, how the market's been. Yeah, I think that. You know, a lot of people are probably over leveraged one because the market was so good. Everything was going up so fast. Right. Cap rates are going to deflate and and they're going to get higher and, and values are going to go down. And yeah, some people are probably going to get caught with their pants down. And, you know, at the end of the day, you just got to underwrite correctly and you can't get too greedy uh, when the market's so hot like it was, you know, the saying, obviously, be greedy when others are fearful and uh, fearful and others are greedy. That's, I mean, that's the exact situation of why you wouldn't want to be overbuying and, and overpaying for properties. And I'm sure that's been happening a lot uh, in the past four or five years. Absolutely. So, um, so has there ever, has there been a, uh, a single kind of financial decision that made a significant impact on you? And if there was that you have a good example of, uh, kind of what'd you learn from it or what's, what was your big takeaways from that decision? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would look back to, to probably when I first started, um, and just how creative I had to be because I was broke really, uh, to be honest with you in in 2017, when I got started, I, I had maybe $2,000 in my checking account 
and and I think my net worth was probably negative twenty thousand dollars with my student loans. And so, um, you know, I was in a position that I that I couldn't really invest in anything, you know. But I I did have some money saved up in my four hundred one k, and so the decision that I made was to take out a hardship exemption against my four hundred one k, penalty free, uh, because there is an exemption to to be a first time home buyer. Uh, so you don't have to pay a penalty if you withdraw from your 401k to cover that down payment. And so I pulled the money out from that to be able to buy my first house and close on that first house. And, you know, that decision changed the trajectory of my life over the past six years. And um, I would absolutely do it over again. Wow. That's a, uh... I feel like you asked Dave Ramsey, Hey, this is what I plan to do. That dude would be like, <laughs> he'd be screaming at you. Don't do it. Yeah. What man, what I guess possessed you to take that leap. I mean, that I'm, that's a scary situation. I'm sure you're scared, right? Yeah. I think I was more so reading. Um, I was probably reading 10 X at the time by Grant yeah. Cardone and yep. <laughs> you Good know one. how he feels about 401ks and, and, you know, I, I don't even remember how I found that out really, because that wasn't in any book that I read. I think that I had maybe spoken to the HR lady that ran our 401k at work. And, and yeah. I think that she knew about it and, and she brought it up and um, I was really intrigued did my homework through the IRS website and um, knew it would be a possibility for me to do. And so, and I think, so I, I did that. I got my tax return at exactly the right time. And I just had enough money to close on the house. Um, so it, it was tight to make that first deal work probably tighter than, you know, most people want to cut it, but um, you know, it, it certainly changed, changed my life uh, for the good. And I still don't invest in a 401k and I probably never will. And, you know, I, I do take a similar stance as uh, grant on some of those, um, 401k and IRAs. I, I do believe in self-directed IRA if you can find one that works and find a custodian that works, but um, I unfortunately haven't been able to. Hey, okay. So try to try to put yourself back in 2017 and I guess looking from, you're looking at that guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, actually, no, put, your, put yourself back in those shoes. What were the emotions, I guess, when you were signing the paperwork to pull that money out I mean, were you scared? Were you like, just don't think, just go kind of walk us through kind of what you were feeling then? Cause I'm sure that's crazy, right? Yeah. That's probably my, um, you know, that that's where I'm at fault sometimes in life is I tend to make decisions, uh, pretty quickly. I have a pretty low threshold for information needed to take action on things. Um, and so, you know, I was very convicted at that time that it's what I needed to do to, to change my life and take a step forward. Um, just based on the education that I had done, you know, reading two to three books um, every couple of weeks on real estate, you know, I was very confident in that process and very confident that this rental would work out for me. So, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really scared to do it. I, I was pretty confident in that process and and I was excited, you know, I was excited to be able to knock that living expense out and, uh, start collecting some rent checks for my roommates and and save money so I could start changing my life. Matt, that's, did you have like a, a mentor or somebody that's done it before that was guiding you or what would you, or is it just you out there running and gunning? Yeah. I mean, I, I was into bigger pockets, you know, I'd probably yeah. listened to a hundred, 150 episodes by that point on top of reading uh, multiple brain and Turner books and, and other books that they had released. And so, um, I, I would say bigger pockets has been the most influential mentor for me, uh, indirectly, uh, and Brandon Turner, David Green, those guys, uh, indirectly have been so immensely helpful in the, the education that they put out. Um, you know, they've really changed the landscape of how people are educated through real estate. And, um, you know, I was, I was not taught any of that stuff growing up. And when I started to read real estate books and learn all this stuff, I honestly got pissed off. I was like, why has nobody ever taught me this? Like I I was really frustrated. And, and so I, 
you know, I'm really passionate now about continuing that education through real estate um, because it's just not taught in our school system, unfortunately. Um, and if I had to do it all over, I probably wouldn't go back to college because um, none of this stuff was taught to me. You know, if, if I could do it all over again, I would just invest in a mentorship or invest in a real estate education or a real estate course or, or be an agent. You know, there are so many uh, different options that cost a lot less money that give you immediate utility to go out and start making money yourself. And so um, I'm extremely passionate about the education of real estate. And that's, you know, one of the things that made me so confident to be able to make that decision to move forward and, and start taking action. That's, I mean, that's a great story. That that needs to be the beginning of every single one of your videos is <laughs> 2017, I was broke. I emptied my <laughs> 401k to start real estate investing and just, I mean, that's a, that's a, attention grabber right there. You know, that's a good, For sure. that, that's a great story. And I grew up, I don't know about you. I, I grew up middle-class um, and I was kind of taught you only thing you can do is save, save money, save right. money, save money. And, you know, 401ks is always a, a big one for, you know, people talk about, Oh, you know, will this job match your 401k and stuff? And you kind of threw all that out the window. It sounds like, you were probably taught similar growing up. Is that true? Or I just wasn't really taught anything, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I remember I bought my first car when I was 14. My dad said, you know, you just got to save all your money and, and you got to go buy your first car. And so I took out a loan to buy my first car. And that's really the, the extent of my financial education growing up. And so, um, you know, when I started reading these books and learning this stuff, it, it just it blew my mind that that nobody teaches this and like people don't really talk about it. And, um, you know, just talking about money in general is, is kind of taboo in society. And, and, you know, unfortunately growing up, it was like that for me. We never talked about money and never talked about investing or anything like that. And so, um, I felt like I was born again at 26 years old, reading all this real estate stuff. And, and it just blew my mind, opened my mind to all the possibilities, obviously rich dad, poor dad was in there and, and yeah. the other Kiyosaki books. And, um, so, you know, it's just changed how I think and, and I've never turned back. Yeah. Is, uh, is that kind of what got you motivated to start putting out the Instagram reels and YouTube shorts and stuff like that is, looking back at 14 year old Mitch and like, didn't have anybody to teach you and kind of, you know, there's with social media, you know, kids are getting on younger and younger and they're mm -hmm. looking for, um, you know, they got young 18 year old driving Lamborghinis and telling them, you yeah. know, drop shipping this and that is that kind of what has you motivated is you want to educate basically your 14 year old self, like, yeah, I just, you know, I hope to serve somebody with the content yeah. and the material. And that that's really the goal with it is, um, you know, there's so much content and information out there for people to consume. And unfortunately, we just live in a consumption society right now. And so yeah, you could sit on your phone for 40 hours a week and, and consume and consume and consume, but never do anything with it. Um, and so, you know, my goal with the content is hopefully inspire people to take that step and, and take action and, you know, be able to tell my story about why I was so passionate about taking action, because I mean, being involved in real estate yourself, you know, it, you hear it all the time. Like people just get overwhelmed with the different strategies, you know, all the possibilities with real estate. It's almost like, it's almost like real estate is, there's too many ways to win. I think I heard, I heard somebody say this the other day, there's too many ways to win. Um, because, you know, with real estate, there's so many strategies you can pursue to make money. And if you can't make a decision and pick a strategy, then you just sit on your butt and you never get started. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we see that way too often with real estate. And I think it's why so many people don't get started. So hopefully, yeah, just inspiring somebody to to take action, do that first deal and, and get their foot in the door. Because once they do that, like the second, third and fourth become way easier. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Are you, uh, do you have anybody that's reached out or do you kind of, are you mentoring anybody to kind of take them along on your deals to teach them? Or is that kind of future video plans to 
break down deals that you're actually in? Absolutely. Yeah. So I've, I've started to bring on some, some mentees as well to get them going, uh, start doing their first deals. And the biggest like shift for me when I, I went from part-time to full-time into this was, uh, just doing the direct to seller marketing. Uh, you know, I was doing it part-time I was doing, you know, two or three deals here and there. And, and it wasn't really consistent. I was looking on Zillow, relying on word of mouth. And then, you know, I, I found out about the off market direct to seller marketing. I, I never really wanted to spend the money on that stuff uh, when I was doing it part-time, but I went into it full-time and I knew I just had to make that leap and do it. Um, and so, you know, hopefully just teaching people that kind of that mindset of what you need to do uh, to find the best deals that are out there and then just teaching them the, those processes and how they can go find those and close them. That's great. Yeah. Hey, you, you've given us a lot of good information. I love, you know, wh where I appreciate you coming on. Um, we're running a little long on time. So I just want to ask you kind of one more question, um, especially mm -hmm. with the market moving forward, a uh, little more volatile, a um, little different than what we've seen in the past five years. Uh, what what keeps you motivated and hungry moving forward or just your day-to-day -day in your investing journey? That's a really good question. I think what keeps me motivated is just the chase. Um, you know, knowing that I'm evolving as a person and as an investor, always, um, always learning more, trying to take that next step. Um, you know, I realize there's going to be ups and downs in the market. Uh, but as long as, you know, as long as I can rely on my numbers and my underwriting at the end of the day, I'll be fine um, and, and try to adjust with the market as it goes. But yeah, what really made, motivates me is just the future. You know, I, I have goals that I want to hit and, um, you know, I'm laser focused on those and I always will be. And I know that when I hit the next goal, there's going to be one that's 10 times bigger. And, and you know, that's what always keeps me motiv motivated is it's just that chase um, of getting to the next level of my career and um, enjoying the process as I do it. Is there any goals that you'd be willing to share with us? Oh man. Just one or two, if, if you don't mind, <laughs> it's all, you don't have to. Yeah. The, uh, the goal this year is to take down at least a hundred units uh, in multifamily. Um, big goal. So that, that's a big one on the plate. Um, looking to do my first million dollar year. Um and revenue. So, you know, that's a big goal as well of mine, but those are two that I'll leave you with. Dang. Yeah. Those are big goals, Mitch. I, I can't wait to see, especially with you putting out your content, you know, hopefully you hit those goals and I'll definitely be following you to, uh, you know, follow your journey and stuff like that. But yeah, we need to get going. Uh, is there any last thing, uh, where can people find you, reach out to you, stuff like that? Yeah, just uh, my first and last name on pretty much every platform. Just Mitch Howard. Um, last name spelling's a little funky, so you may have to put that in the show notes for people. But yeah, uh, just Mitch Mitch Howard on uh, pretty much every platform. Otherwise, you know, I appreciate the support from you, Ryan, and I appreciate you uh, doing this and taking the time out to to do this. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it was great having you on. You have a lot of great knowledge and stuff that hopefully we can get out to the masses. I know you're working hard at that too. And uh, so, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Be sure to follow us on all uh, social media platforms and where you listen to podcasts. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you, sir. Thank you.